Welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics podcast. Today, we are talking to Kimothy Joy, which we mentioned in the beginning. She has a book coming out this week called Extraordinary Wing Women, True Stories and Life-Altering, World-Changing Sisterhood. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Kimothy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Celebrate and share. Well, we talk so much about the power of community and connection and conversation and this book really spoke to that. Um, your book tells over 30 stories of sisterhood, of friendship, whether it be in the public eye or historically. It was a wide variety. So my first question is, why now? Why this book? Well, this book came to me while writing my first book, which is That's What She Said, Wise Words from Influential Women, which features 50 women throughout history and present day and women who've just accomplished incredible things and really stood out in their field and um, broken barriers and yeah, done amazing things. And the idea came to me and just kept knocking at my door and these stories were begging to be told. Um, when I just realized there was a common thread behind all these women, it was like lifting up the, the engine of a car and realizing behind all these powerhouse women, there were incredible women, surprise, shocker. But it, I was just thinking, do people know this, that Frida Kahlo had this best friend or Julia Child had this best friend who helped her, you know, publish her cookbook. And it was just like all these stories I had never heard before. And I just had the epiphany that, oh, my goodness, we need to share more of these stories because, you know, in our culture, we've been building up this boss babe um, story or ideal and this hustle culture has permeated everything. And a lot of women are feeling so much anxiety and burnout and overwhelm. And for me, I think it's so timely. I mean, it's been five years in the making. Like I said, it came from the first book, which was published in 2018. But um, I've been working on this book for five years. And I mean, it's just been the right time. You know, it's always been the right, the right time um, since the idea came, because I think it's the antidote and the solution to this burnout we're all feeling. And we need sisterhood, we need one another. Right. You know, we, Colleen and I, we were speaking before we started recording and we had an event recently and one of the women there asked a question and you mentioned, and I believe in the preface of your book about women feeling in competition, all this thing, kind of like what you were kind of referring to earlier about boss lady and the burnout and pushing ahead, but this competition where they felt like there wasn't enough room for everybody at the table. But this book, with the women that you included this book and the friendships, it seems like you get so much more when women are lifting each other up. How did you decide to find these stories with that? Yeah, I mean, and even just personally, I was raised as a little girl in a rural town in Ohio um, to believe that myth of separation and competition. Like I felt that in you know, growing up in middle school and high school, and it was portrayed in the media, like the movies I was watching. And I know the tide is turning, you know, in media, and we're all realizing, wow, you know, we don't have to be in competition, but that's how I grew up. And that was my programming. And since then, I've been unraveling that. Um, and yeah, that's basically my personal story and why this is so important to me. And I want to share um, these stories of sisterhood because I, I want to raise my daughter um, to know that we don't have to compete, but there's room for everybody. And it's more fun and more joyful when we support one another and we come together and we can do so much more and make such a bigger impact on the world. And so that's why I thought these, you know, 30 stories were so important to share because the world needs us. The world needs our gifts, our voices, our medicine, and this is how we do it. It feels like a very practical way like lifestyle change is to embrace sisterhood before we kind of break down the different categories of friendships that you have in the book did you find any running themes throughout these relationships was there something that kind of stood out to you and said this is what real support looks like this is what sisterhood mm -hmm. looks like it's such a great question thank you I think two things that really just are coming to me are the vulnerability of asking for help and for practice and it's a practice I still do it and it's still hard 
Um, and I think sisterhood is a practice, like stepping into this lifestyle where you're willing to open up to other women, especially if you've had, you know, a turbulent past with women, which I've had, but even with my own mother, you know, it's complicated. There's a lot of wounds that show up and even historically for us. Um, and I think it is a practice of being vulnerable and saying, you know, I'm not doing okay to the people closest to us. And I think a lot of us, um, still think it's a sign of weakness. And that was a major thing for me in these stories to realize that, I mean, sometimes these women were in crisis and they just were broken down and it was so obvious they needed help. But I realized, wow, there's so much power and strength when we just know that we're not okay and that we ask directly to the women in our lives, the people around us for that help. And if and we have that self-awareness and we practice that, it's hard. It it is so hard, and so. you know, and you think oh, the vulnerability, is. and you you show so many examples in the different people that you talk about their sisterhood, and another thing I felt like it it almost seems like everybody, most of the women that you talk about in the book, had to face misogyny, had to face whatever it was, some group of males, you know, really bashing them or really whether abusive physically or mentally or just squandering uh, what they needed to do to get ahead, whether it was school or something for their country. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say, how did you figure out how to find these women and what they did? Mm, okay. Um, well, I mean, they came from the, a lot of the women that are featured in this book are from the first book. And so I'm telling like another level, another layer of their story and like how they did it because the first book was like, you know, it was short and like just one page bi biography, which is actually what we get in school and what we usually know. And then we're like, we're left thinking, wow, they're so special. They must be such a genius. Like how'd they do that on their own? And so this book feels like just the perfect follow-up and showing like, no, oh, they didn't do it alone. This is how, and this is what it looked like. And they didn't, you know, have it all figured out and they were asking for help or messing up and a woman would come in and, and help them. And so, yeah, a lot of those women are featured in the first book. And then others, you know, are more well-known like um, Oprah and Gail, and they're, you know, the more popular ones that we love. But um, I also had friends helping me. So that's <laughs> very, you know, symbolic of this whole thing um I asked I crowdsourced I asked a lot of my friends I'm like what stories do you know like are there incredible friendships in history that have stood out I have a lot of friends that are just like uh voracious readers so that's great and I was just like send me everything and then I had other friends like you know it was like a book club the whole time I was writing this I'm like okay you read this biography <laughs> you read this memoir because it's so much reading because so many of these stories were buried like there aren't especially if you go back um in history and literature like it's really hard to find these stories. You have to be reading like five, you know, to 10 different books and like pulling out the threads and you're like, try, you know, I'm like not trying to fabricate, make it up. I needed firsthand accounts and letters and that it's a lot, but it made me angry because I was like, these types of bonds between women haven't been historically valued because they haven't been written about, especially women of color. I was like, just, I had to move through that being infuriated um and then I was like okay it's even more important that we tell these stories and show how multifaceted women are and how um these women are able to do what they what they've done um I don't know if that answered your question oh no I think it does <laughs> it does yeah it's yeah great. so that was how they kind of found me you know and it mm -hmm. was friends just being like have you heard like everyone just got so excited about it because it's like it's been a process of self-discovery and getting to know myself and the people in my life better you know, it's written me, this book has written me. And I think my friends felt the same way. They're like, oh my gosh, and this is one of my favorite stories. And this really resonates. And oh, so that's, that's how yeah. it came together. It's been like the ultimate co-creation. Like it's been a crew of people who helped and put I, this together. I felt, yeah, I felt like that was so um, neat about the book was that, yes, yes, you know, like you said, you had Oprah and Gail and you had Jane Goodall and you have um, Amelia Earhart. Julia Child, but you also have stories from so far back or current, you know, mm -hmm. or very current, very recent stories about women doing things and, you know, it's telling the backstory and how they had the friends helping them. And I think when women hear these stories, I found this in everything that we've talked about on the podcast, 
that they don't feel alone. When they mm-hmm. see what another woman has gone through and they're like, oh, they did have to work. It wasn't as easy for them to get ahead. Then people don't feel alone. Absolutely. They're like, yeah. me too. Oh, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. Like, because oftentimes we're like, why can't I do this? Or, and, and all, like most of these women felt that way. They had the self-doubt, the imposter syndrome, like all the things that are so unique to being women. And then like, based on your ethnicity, like where you're from, like the women that bonded and um, supported these women, they knew uniquely their barriers and what they were up against. And it was like, you know, they connected with women who were a couple steps ahead of them, like in a similar career path or, you know, um, a movement. And so they could guide them and shepherd them. And they knew what, you know, it's like, watch out for that step. I've hit that before. I've come, I've come up with that misogyny or racism, whatever it is, like, let me guide you. Like I've been there. And so, yeah, they definitely um, felt less, less alone. And I think that's how I felt reading it and everybody else. It's like, oh, there isn't something wrong with me. Okay. Maybe I can do this. Maybe I just need to like, look at my support system and my circle. And I think that resonates with so many women because we have a lot of knowledge, especially as we get to a certain age and they want to be able to share it and they want to say, oh, watch out for that pothole. Like that's coming your way. And it's sometimes hard to get a younger generation, at least in the United States. I think it's a little easier abroad, but in the United States to get the younger generation to actually listen. Like, you know, Bridget, I mean, I think my kids must think that I was just born this age, like never experienced my 20s or 30s, just born this age. But one of my favorite stories, because I happen to love Misty Copeland, um, was the story that you told about her. She's a ballerina, but she represents just a healthy, strong, vibrant young woman who did not allow the voices of so many naysayers tell her she could not be a premium ballerina. And she actually was able to look back at Raven Wilkinson, who I had never heard of before you mentioned the book and um, say, oh no, she did it already. Like I can do what she did. Can you talk about that story? I love that story. It's like, I, I'm going to say it's one of my favorites about all 30 of these stories, but it just <laughs> when you were talking about the generations to intergenerational relationship, I immediately thought of Misty. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's such a great example of um, connecting, um, embracing a mentor who's many steps ahead of you and just, you know, opening up like inviting in that wisdom and it's made all the difference for misty like she's really become a leader and a role model like outside even the dance world and it was um raven that helped her do that and like find her voice and her courage and inspire her to just really her career to take off and and it also speaks to the power of representation and just seeing someone that looks like you who moved past you know seemingly impossible barriers. And so I think Raven was dancing when, uh, like in the 1950s with an all white ballet company um, in the segregated South. And um, Misty came upon her while watching like films, like old films of ballet companies. And she said she was just shocked when she saw a black woman dancing on stage with an all white, you know, um, cast or dance team. And she was shocked to see someone back then who looked like her on the stage dancing because she had never heard of her. And it was that moment that she just felt seen and understood and like, oh, me too, I'm not alone. I'm trying to break through the ballet world as a woman of color. And to, for her to like actively bond um, and form this beautiful relationship with Raven where I, I think they would get coffee all the time. They found that they both lived in New York. She showed up to like every performance she gave and she was there just you know giving her loving presence like encouraging misty um through every show um it just speaks to the power of that you know generational relationship yeah i love that I love that story so much it's uh, i loved that when she was looking for her uh when misty was looking for raven raven already knew about her she that, already knew about her and she'd been yes. going to all her performances yes I just, that like almost made me cry <laughs> because <laughs> I thought, oh my goodness, you know, that the, all this time that they were looking for each other probably, or she found her, but 
I, I love that whole connection and story. And it wasn't as if Raven was so happy for her, not like, oh, somebody's going to steal my thunder. It wasn't at all about that. She was so thrilled for her. So proud to, of her. Yes, yeah, so proud mm -hmm. of her. And there's so many stories that you have in there that are just like that. And and so many great ones that I'd never heard of and the, the courage that these women have, like the ones that go way back, the um, the sisters um, that fought in Vietnam. Can you share a little bit about this? And this is how, I mean, can you can help me with the years because I'm trying to remember how far back <laughs> oh, this was. I the, mean, sure. I yes. think it, I'll probably have to look in my own book, which I have Yeah, here. but it was, it was Tang. I've got my notes, but I'm like, um, yes. oh think, yeah. Was it 39 Trung, Trung, AD? Yeah. 39 yeah. AD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably one of the older, yeah, the oldest stories in here. Um, I tried to pull out some of those and, you know, it was harder to like sure. dig in and find, you know, source material, but it, I thought it was just so encouraging, inspiring, even just to like wonder about it, like what it would have um, took for women at that time to stand up to like oppressive governments or groups or yeah, and sisters too, and just right. like the visual imagery, like they're like warrior women, and yes, taught and by I, their father, taught right, which I think taught by so their important. father. Yeah, yeah, they were so incredible to me. Um, and then another story too, I love uh, Lima Kaboi and the peace builders in Liberia. Um, that story, oh my goodness. Lima has um a memoir, and I'm forgetting the name, but it is so worth reading. Um, it just talks about the women in Liberia, how they rallied together, even across religious lines, like Christian and Muslim, which hadn't been done before, but they created a movement and they helped end um, a 13, 14 year civil war in Liberia by, you know, standing together and having sit-ins and they were actually pretty creative about it too, like in their activism and also the way they circled up. Um, I think it was called shedding the weight is what oh, they did yeah. to begin yeah. every meeting. Like that was so mm -hmm. moving to me. Like mm -hmm. I cried or reading about that. Um, where at the when, at the beginning of the movement, when the women would gather, um, they would sit in circle and let every woman go around and have a turn to speak and just share, like share about what happened to her during this war and like what she saw and what she wanted to like, what weight she wanted to shed and leave with the women. And that is how they began every meeting. And it, sometimes it would go on for hours and that bonded them though, just letting everybody have a voice and to share, you know, their right. experiences and what they saw because nobody ever asked them. It was just like, and they were carrying all these tragedies with themselves and holding it all in. And so I just thought that was such a beautiful practice for I thought, like a bigger yeah. movement that end, helped end a war. Like that speaks to the potential and what's possible when we circle up this way. Right. I, I was amazed too, because so many of them had been raped. So many, you know, Lost things children, that had happened to they, them and they wouldn't speak of it because they felt just the shame of that. They felt shame for whatever happened to them that was beyond their control. Mm -hmm. And they were probably, you know, too scared to even bring it because they could have thought that they caused it for some reason. And but to be able to share that with other women with similar experiences was really amazing. And it, and it speaks, you know, that too was pretty recent. And yeah, yeah, that was very recent. And as I read that, I thought, how, why didn't I know more about this? It wasn't in our news as much as other things. And I'm learning... I just felt really, I almost, we don't like, know a lot. We think we, we don't know, know a lot. Know a lot. Really, we, we don't know a lot of stories of, of strong women in history. I mean, there are strong women in history. Don't get me wrong, but we don't know enough of them. Right. We're not told enough of them. And in this book, you know, that section falls under leaders and peacemakers. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a great section of the book. You also have one of my personal idol, idols, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which, you know, yep. I could go on, but mm -hmm. the fact that Sandra Day O'Connor was the first female in the Supreme Court and their ideals couldn't be di more different. Yeah. You know, their their opinions, their political beliefs were completely different, yet they both understood the importance of their job, that they were the first and second women to be appointed to the Supreme Court. And I think, I I've said this before, but I think a lot of our problems in the world could be fixed if we just put women in power. Because- it, yeah. the ego gets in the way and mm -hmm. 
it, it they knew what was more important. It wasn't mm-hmm. their ideology. It was mm-hmm. the position they were given. And again, thinking of it as a privilege, as opposed to a, like, I'm going to conquer this. I'm going to be the most, it was a privilege to be one of the first or second women. And then you go into women liberating women, which is also a really interesting section. And, and I love the story of um, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who are the transgender friendship that went through. And I love that Marsha P. Johnson, the P stood for pay it no mind. I mean, that was just awesome. That just stuck out to me in the book and how like they really were at the forefront of transgender rights back in the sixties, which I, I can't even imagine trying to be somebody who's transgender in the sixties. It's hard enough now, You're right? Mm-hmm. but to have somebody solid that you can go to and say, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. Everybody needs that. How did you choose that? How did you even discover them? Um, well, Marsha P. Johnson was in my first book. Okay. So Stonewall. I was already, mm-hmm. yeah, Stonewall movement. And I was just, you know, in love with her and her story. And um, she was so effervescent, like reading about her. I was like, oh my God, she just maintained such joy in her activism. And so did Sylvia. And I think that's what they bonded over. They like, from what I read, they just had such playful energy, even though it was really tragic what they endured and what they were up against, you know, being outsiders of you know, the gay rights movement at that time. And they were really like fighting for a voice and to be made visible in that movement. And I think, you know, they were the pioneers of that, that we have to thank because they really started um, so much of it. Um, but I just loved that their bond was also, it felt, like I can feel the joy and the vibrancy and like, yeah, just like hate no mind. Like we've got this, like right. that takes so much courage to have joy and playfulness. Right. I mean, they Being had that, like, you know, in that position and just learning what I did about their childhood and the abuse. And that just breaks my heart. Just thinking about yeah, a child having to go through that and they found one another and bonded and also other, you know, people that's, they form their own tribe, their own support network their own chosen family when their families ostracized and abused them for who they were. And, and it's, that was amazing. I oh, was just the way that, um, that she looked after, uh, her when she was 11 years old, right. You know, so young, just, 11 years yeah, old and they were like on the streets old. in New York city. I just, Good. yeah. Ooh. And I think now it's so important for people to be able to say, wait, I, there's someone I can, just like you were saying, um, before with Misty Copeland, that there was someone historically that she could look to that she, resonated with her. Not a lot of people know about Marsha P. Johnson. And even though there's a statue, I guess, somewhere, but I didn't know that either. But to be able to say, no, look back in the 60s, there was somebody I can look to and it resonates with me and I, and I can see myself. It's so important to be able to see yourself in other people and know that just kindness and positive words carry so much weight. Mm, that's so <laughs> true. And like, yeah, another like, I guess, main insight from the book and all these stories that came through was like, don't underestimate the power of a kind word or offering like a gesture, like or an act of service. Like it, it can make all the difference in someone's lives a life. And um, a lot of these stories reflect that like one letter, you know, one act, one paying for something like a tuition, like what it could be dollars, it could be, you know, verbal like affirmations. And so I did try to include stories that, you know, showed all the different types of love languages of these female bonds. And I think really too, I'm, you know, in our culture, everyone wants to be famous and they want to be in the spotlight and they want to be, you know, the one like on the stage, but this book really speaks to the significance and the beauty of being beside someone or behind the scenes and supporting them and how that's just equally as important and of value. And yes. it, it's rewarding. It's so rewarding to be that person and like help them step into their gifts and remind them of who they are and their potential and um, to see them shine. It's so important. It, it is. I love the sharing too. So most of us have heard of Marian Anderson uh, because of the the whole well, that she sang when Eleanor Roosevelt said, I'm going to quit the DAR um, and, because you're not letting her sing. 
of wherever mm-hmm. they were singing. And, mm-hmm. but I didn't know the backstory about Marian Anderson. I didn't know how she brought the other women up. I, you know, that, that was, I thought great because she was well known. Yes. That's one of my, again, one of my favorite stories. I, when I think about them, um, those women coming out of Chicago, Chicago, black women, um, musicians breaking into the classical music industry, which was historically white male. Um, they were so incredible because they basically created like a creative incubator. Like they were writing music, playing music, singing music, and they would pass it along. And they created this little like network like where they were really helping um, one another break, you know, open doors, move through these doorways into the industry. And I didn't know that either. But like, yeah, she wanted Marianne would um, sing a song and or write a piece of music and then another one would play it or they just really supported one another in a creative way. I, I loved that. And it, it reminded me too, I could picture it. And you talked about the Bronte sisters as well in the book. Mm-hmm. And I just picture where like the whole writing process going on, the whole <laughs> creative process with mm-hmm. Marian Anderson and the composers, e- everything happening there. I, you know, you really, really told that well. I love that whole process. Oh yeah. I, again, the creative incubator, like create a safe space where you can practice, like whether it's singing or writing music and, or writing stories or novels. I think that's what stood out to me, like find like a little hub, like a writing circle or an art or music circle and where it feels safe and that you can be vulnerable and, you know, practice being brave and your creativity. That's what a lot of these stories reflect. And I also like the fact that some of your stories will talk about, like, I'm going to probably butcher this name, the Galabi, Galabi, Galabi gang. Yeah. Okay. The Galabi gang. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you'll tell stories of radical change where the Galabi gang and they um, were vigilantes who took justice into their own hands in India. And now they are 400,000 strong members, but then you'll tell quiet strength too in the earth guardians. And I think it's important for people to realize that the strength of friendship, the strength of community, it doesn't have to change the entire world. It can just change your view of the world, your immediate family, friends. Like it doesn't have to be grandiose, but yet that change can be a domino effect to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I think the Earth Guardians, I just love the the story of, and I'm again, going to butcher, Isatu Mm -hmm. Sise, is it? So, oh, where they that. wove yeah. plastic they had saw plastic bags oh, in the streets yes yeah is that is satu i'll just say the is satu. okay uh, yes yeah, yeah, i, I love that's right. how you the say cooperative it, yeah. the um, right. i love is to say story because mm-hmm. they just saw bags and garbage in the street and they were like you know what not only am i going to create something beautiful but i'm actually going to create an economy for women to make money Mm-hmm. so change can come in so many, you you really represent this book that change can come in so many ways when you're supported by people how did you find that story don't tell me it was in the last book because I'm just going to feel bad no it wasn't and I don't okay, even good. know oh I do okay it, it was from a children's book and I really? don't remember the name but I'm going to go look it up after this yeah one of my books my daughter had it um, I found that in a children's book and I was just like, what, who are these women? And I saw it was based on a true story. And so I went and read all about them. And yeah, just like you said, um, you start where you are in your local community, in your circles and looking at what the problems are. Okay. How can we work together? How can we circle up and everybody can contribute ideas and their strengths and their gifts to figure out how we can problem solve. And it's such a different way of living in the world. And there's so much we can do when we're collaborating and gathering. And that was so creative. Like so right. much creativity um, came from yeah. trash on the ground and plastic bags yes. everywhere. And you know, the thing about that story too that I really love is that people mocked, I don't love that this happened to them, but I liked how they turned it around. But um, people mocked them initially. They're like, what are you doing? Like digging through the trash, collecting those trash, just seeing all these women gather the trash bags. Um, and then like start to put together, like weave together these beautiful creations, like these purses and all these things. Um, they got a lot of flack, you know, at the beginning. And that often happens when you're trying something new and being innovative and, you know, 
for your woman too. If you're women, yeah. that can happen <laughs> often. Like what? Nobody's ever done that. But when you have one another's support, you can be like, okay, it's okay. We can do it. We got this. We'll keep going. And I feel like that's, that was the essence of what they did. Was- yeah, that, that one too. They're all so, they're just great stories. I'm sitting here, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I, the, the athletic ones and just how they came through with that. Um, your uh, Amelia Earhart. Oh, Oh, I was just going to say, I, I thought it was really creative for you to leave it blank and let people mm-hmm. write their own kind of friendship mm-hmm. story or because it's a beautiful gift. If someone yes. wants to give this as a holiday gift or a birthday present for their best friend or their sister or whomever, it gives them that that place to kind of write why someone else made a difference. And I think that's a really great idea for the book. Thank you. I think so too. And it's, yeah, it's a chance to like write it down and like, think about having that written in a book someone gave you, or they can write out like what you've done, you know, in their life and the difference you've made. And, you know, candles are great and all the other gifts we can give our, our besties and our moms and our grandmas. But I was like, what would be like really meaningful that would, they'd be like, oh my gosh, every time they opened it up, like they'd be left with your words and like what you mean to them. Yes. So I just... I had to do that. And the, the first book, that's what she said, has a blank page too, where you can profile an influential woman in your life. And so there's so much power in words and gifting those to other people to let them know how much they mean. And like those small things really do add up. So it's a chance to pass that on. Yeah. I feel like your examples too, from the stories, when you read those stories and then you get to that page, you kind of have, especially for people like me that aren't so good at writing, you have kind of like, oh, well, this is how she was, she told this. So then you can remember a time in your life when somebody helped you and somebody told you and stood by you, you can just write down what happened, you know? Yeah, right. And that you're making me think too, like another um, insight that came from reading all these stories is that like, it made me feel at ease and relieved um, because I felt like I, I don't have to do it all and uh, to achieve what I want to achieve in this life. Like I don't have to be good at right. Like, you know, whatever it is for, you know, you or me, like we're not great at everything, but we all, I think we all have like a zone of genius. And when we can just focus on that and then allow other people to help us with the things that we're not so great at, which so many women in this book demonstrated, like some are really shy and didn't like public speaking. So they would be with a really gregarious, like outgoing friend who was their publicist. And she'd do most of the talking. Like I thought that was Marie Curie. Yeah. She had a really outgoing friend and sis- or daughters and sister who she was so shy and timid, you know, the great scientist Marie. And she just hated being in the limelight. It was really uncomfortable for her, but she surrounded herself with women who were comfortable speaking and they would be like a buffer for her. Um, with the reporters and all the press because it was so overwhelming to her. She's an introvert. She just wanted to do her work. Um, but they really helped her embrace that being in the public eye because they showed up with their gifts. They they loved that and they let her be her. And there's a lot of examples of that. And that made me feel like, oh, okay, like I can just be me and do my thing and I can have you know, ask for help with these other areas and let other people shine and do what they're good at. Well, I think that especially nowadays where the world is just upside down and backwards. And it's nice to just have positive stories in a book where you can read that there are relationships that create greatness in other people and that there are positive ways to move forward. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Kimthi, we wish you the best of luck with this book and keep us posted on the next one because yes. we'd love to have could, you back. Do you mind holding up the, your book for um, people oh, watching you. this? Yes. And you do like all the artwork as well. It's beautiful. I do. Yes. yes. I, I do. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me and letting me share. Um, feels like I had a baby. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, is everyone going to like my baby? That's like yeah. a moment, but it feels very special to be able to share it with you all. And thank you for the great conversation. Um, and yeah, actually I started watercolor painting with a group of women um, many years ago. That's how it all started just for fun, just to like, you know, a little art therapy with some wine and I haven't stopped since. <laughs> and that's how it all began. And of course, look at you know, that. this is what I would be writing. It's come full circle. 
Um, so yeah, I do all the watercolor artwork and it's like therapy for me. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's it, beautiful. It is. It beautiful. is. It's a work Thank of you. art. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming yes. on. We appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Colleen. I really appreciate what you're doing and all the, um, layers of womanhood that you're amplifying <laughs> and sharing and we have a lot of layers so like, <laughs> we do we have layers. multitudes lots of layers yeah. some feel it's fun right to explore it is. all right thank you i appreciate thank it you.